NASA also tasked the school to conduct a series of high-altitude balloon flights using mice as test subjects. These so-called space mice were sent aloft in 1960 to determine the possible physiological effects of prolonged exposure to cosmic radiation. The mice and other living organisms, including fruit flies and mosquito eggs, made their space voyage aboard a School of Aviation Medicine built life support capsule called a biocell. That represents, those are little dots of ink representing mosquito eggs. And we did that just to show the completeness of the package. The most important NASA program that school scientists were contracted to conduct at Brooks Air Force Base involved a series of space cabin experiments. These tests were a continuation of research that Dr. Billy Welch had conducted during the 1950s. The earlier space cabin experiments had culminated with Airman Farrell's simulated moon trip. That test was followed by a more ambitious and practical simulated flight in September 1958 with the world's first two-man space cabin simulation. Dr. Bruno Balke and Senior Master Sergeant Samuel Karst spent a then record 10 days in the space cabin. We got active in the what we call a two-man space cabin simulator and uh, started examining the, the different types of internal spacecraft environments uh, for the compatibility with, uh, with people. The new series of space cabin experiments that NASA tasked Brooks scientists to perform involved exposing two volunteer airmen to a pure oxygen environment at high altitude for 14 and 30 day simulations. These experiments were designed to support NASA's plans for the Gemini and Apollo program, which involved missions of up to two weeks. The third task that NASA initially contracted the school to conduct was monitoring and evaluating the health of NASA astronauts. Teams of Air Force flight surgeons performed pre and post flight astronaut exams they also served as medical monitors during Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions. Stationed at remote locations across the Earth, these School of Aviation Medicine physician scientists monitored astronauts' health through radio telemetry. In those days, we didn't have central communications. And what we did have was stations, I think there were 16 or 18 of them, around the globe. And they would get a short span of the record to be telemetered down to the station and then they would telephone it in or wire it in or something to what was going on but in each one of those stations would be a flight surgeon who would be seeing a short spurt of his electrocardiogram and in order to evaluate what was going on with these guys the only thing we had to monitor them with was the electrocardiogram their respiratory rate and their body temperature and voice and that was about it Some of them, including Dr. Robert MacGyver, had the opportunity to examine astronauts in person. Dr. MacGyver evaluated John Glenn after his orbital flight. Aboard the Navy destroyer NOAA, which had recovered Glenn in his Mercury capsule Friendship 7, MacGyver discovered during the post-flight exam that Glenn's heart had shifted axis as a result of weightlessness. The Air Force's role in medically monitoring and evaluating astronauts was eventually expanded. This was a direct result of the pioneering work of Brooks cardiologist Dr. Lawrence Lamb, who had developed a team of Air Force scientists and physicians to medically evaluate astronauts. We brought all of the Mercury astronauts to the School of Aerospace Medicine, and I put them on the treadmill, and I put them on the tilt tables, and we did all these things to provide a record that they could use as a baseline when these guys were actually in flight. Like Dr. Clawman, Dr. Lamb had made good use of NASA's respect for him to demonstrate the advanced facilities at Brooks for examining Air Force aviators. Well, we did all the baseline studies on, on all of the Mercury and Gemini astronauts, and that was, you know, a big, uh, a big help to, uh, to NASA, because then they, uh, they, they had these tapes and data of all the, every one of the astronauts, what was happening to them, their physiological parameters, when they were under high G forces and zero gravity and stress conditions. NASA responded favorably to Lamb's support and that of the professionalism of Air Force flight surgeons who had served as medical monitors for Mercury flights. The space agency sent to Brooks a group of candidates, 
for selection as potential astronauts to be medically evaluated by Dr. Lamb and his associates. On the basis of Dr. Lamb's recommendations, after an exhaustive series of tests, the second panel of nine military and civilian test pilots had been added to NASA's roster of new astronauts. By 1963, Sam, renamed the School of Aerospace Medicine, had been contracted by NASA to provide medical evaluation for all future astronaut candidates. Many of them were military pilots who Dr. Lamb had previously examined for entry into test pilot training at the Aerospace Research Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base. This school became a key source for Air Force Space Pilot Program candidates. This program, designed to produce Air Force Space Pilots for the X-20 Dinosaur Project, was supported by Brooks Air Force Base Acceleration Research Pioneer, Dr. Sidney Leverett. Bioastronautics. Well, that's just one in the long list of new space age terms I've been learning, Doctor. Now, if I understand you correctly, what we've been talking about is the constant balancing of body capability against the requirements of space. Is, is that the... right? Our students need to study more than just atmospheric physics. They must understand the biological implications of atmospheric physics as well. Uh-huh. What's that over there? It looks like a lesson on anatomy. Yes, in addition to the anatomy lessons, they also receive lectures and demonstrations in stress physiology and in metabolism in order to establish a basic scientific concept of the body, its endurance and its limits. Dinosaur was the logical continuation of the Air Force's X-Series of ultra-high-speed hypersonic aircraft, highlighted by the X-15 program. The goal of the program was to determine if a space plane could be designed for controlled flight outside of Earth's atmosphere. The X-15 flights resulted in valuable research data on aerodynamic heating and adaptive control system performance that the Air Force provided to NASA. Paralleling NASA's manned spaceflight program was the Air Force's Man in Space Dinosaur Project. And the reason the X-20 was called a dinosaur it was a dynamic soaring vehicle, and the, the use of it is you came down from uh, orbit. You never really went into orbit, but you could uh, bounce off the top of the atmosphere, skip around just like a rock over water, so it was a dynamic soaring vehicle that could soar. The X-20 was a manned, reusable space plane that was the predecessor to NASA's then future space shuttle. Dinosaur was the Air Force's answer to going to space. And they were at the very edge of going into space with a plane, which most people don't know. And it was not something that would fire off in a rocket. The problem with the space program in the United States is we didn't have rockets that could put anything in orbit. We couldn't have put a ping pong ball in orbit when Sputnik 1 went up. But the Air Force had developed this other method, and you take up the dinosaur, which is much like the space vehicle. The important space medicine research that the Aerospace Medical Center provided to NASA contributed to President John F. Kennedy's fateful visit to Brooks Air Force Base on November 21, 1963. At the urging of Vice President Johnson, who was instrumental in securing funding for the Aerospace Medical Center, President Kennedy arrived at the base to officially dedicate the most recent group of School of Aerospace Medicine buildings that had been added to the Brooks Complex. In broader perspective, the objective of JFK's trip was to reaffirm the strong support his administration had for the Air Force continuing its assistance to NASA's space exploration program. The President planned to address the public outside the Aerospace Medical Center headquarters. He was well prepared to deliver what became his last public address. It was a memorable speech that a senior Air Force officer at Brooks had helped prepare. John Pickering uh, and I sent the material up to Kennedy for his speech. 
And uh, interestingly enough, uh, he used most of the material that we sent up. And we had heard, and I don't doubt it, that he had not seen that material until he got on the plane to come down here. And this was his first stop. So he evidently perfected that, put in some of his own bright things and thinking of it, like the throwing of the hat over the wall. An estimated 10,000 people watched JFK deliver what became his administration's signature speech on space exploration, known as the Cap Over the Wall Address. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space, and we have no choice but to follow it. Whatever the difficulties, they will be overcome. Whatever the hazards, they must be guarded against. With the vital help of this aerospace medical center, with the help of all those who labor in the space endeavor, with the help and support of all Americans, we will climb this wall with safety and with speed, and we shall then explore the wonders on the other side. Thank you. After making his remarks, President Kennedy and wife Jackie briefly toured Brooks Space Research Facilities. They visited a space cabin chamber experiment where four Lackland Air Force Base Airmen volunteers were sequestered for a month during a simulated space flight. The experiment involved testing a nearly 100% oxygen atmosphere at an altitude comparable to that which exists on the upper slopes of Mount Everest. The Brooks experiment that the president observed supported NASA's critical need for data on how high oxygen concentrations affect astronauts during space flights lasting two weeks or longer. As President Kennedy visited with the altitude test subjects, no one then knew the medical effects of breathing pure oxygen would have on Gemini and Apollo astronauts over periods of several weeks. JFK and his entourage had witnessed at Brooks the culmination of Air Force pioneering space medicine research. It was an outgrowth of the School of Aerospace Medicine's aviation physiology studies that had begun in 1918 at the Mineola Lab in New York and had progressed later at Randolph and Brooks Fields. Aviation and aerospace medicine research to keep aviators safe and healthy was the foundation on which the Air Force and NASA built a deep reservoir of space medicine knowledge. This knowledge immeasurably contributed to human flight beyond Earth's atmosphere. President Kennedy's Brooks visit had elevated the base in the world's consciousness as one of the premier venues for space science research and development. That perception did not change after President Kennedy left Brooks for his rendezvous with destiny in Dallas the next day. America mourned the president's shocking death at the hands of an assassin, just 21 hours after he had reinvigorated the nation with the hope of America's leadership role in space exploration. President Kennedy was, uh, was a great guy. He's just a regular guy, you know, and uh, I, was, I was devastated the next day, you know. Uh, you, know you see man, and, have a conversation with him, and then the next day somebody shoots him, you know, that's, that was just devastating for everyone. It was devastating for the country. The president's commitment to landing a man on the moon did not die with him. The men and women at Brooks Air Force Base kept his vision alive and embraced the many challenges that lay ahead by contributing their expertise to supporting NASA's mission to fulfill President Kennedy's dream. One of the space challenges that the Brooks scientific community embraced was the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, known by the initials MOL. This Air Force Man in Space project was conceived to launch a large satellite vehicle into Earth orbit. It was, in essence, the world's first space station. Designed as a single-use laboratory, the Air Force planned to launch the two-man MOL crew on a 40-day mission and return them to Earth using NASA's Gemini B spacecraft. 
MOL was inaugurated in December 1963, after Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had canceled the Dinosaur Space Plane Project. The Space Lab was developed from early Air Force and NASA concepts of manned space stations to be used for reconnaissance purposes. At that time, uh, NASA, the NASA, NASA Research Langley, Langley NASA Research uh, people were interested in a, a, an advanced development called MORAL, the Manned Orbital Research Laboratory. The concept for MORAL was a large space donut, a circular station that would rotate slowly and produce artificial gravity. The MORAL program never got to the actual uh, advanced development stage. It was still uh, mostly a, a paper and pencil study program. MOL became America's largest non-NASA space program. The space laboratory was designed to develop astronaut capabilities in space. These capabilities included serving as a platform to launch rescue missions for crewmen marooned in damaged spaceships. Such a scenario, which occurred years later during the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, was one of the many concerns that MOL was created to address in support of future manned lunar missions. The legacy of MOL, however, is credited with having helped avert a disaster in space. Air Force space cabin simulation experiments that led to MOL development also provided critically important data that NASA needed to save the lives of the Apollo 13 crew. In April 1970, the spaceship was 200,000 miles from Earth when an oxygen tank exploded. Elevated carbon dioxide levels inside the Apollo 13 command module threatened the lives of astronauts Jim Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Heiss. By the time the Apollo uh, 13 had a problem, uh, we had previously carried out uh, some, I think it was three-week experiments, I believe it was, uh, uh, exposure to uh, carbon dioxide at a level of 3% in the environment. Sort of had a pretty good handle on the, the long-term effects, of the elevated uh, carbon dioxide problems. Six years before Brooks scientists helped NASA safely return Apollo 13 to Earth, the Air Force had selected Brooks Air Force Base as the primary test center for the MOL prototype. The prototype arrived at Brooks in August 1964. The 30-ton, 30 30-by-9-foot 30 MOL was composed of three compartments. The configuration included simulated flight operations, an in-flight research area, and crew quarters. The MOL's central compartment was a 2,000 cubic foot lab. A series of airlocks linked it to a modified Gemini B space vehicle. MOL research at Brooks included space cabin environment simulations, space nutrition studies, and the development of specialized equipment. One of the devices developed during MOL research supported the first space-based exercise device for maintaining astronaut muscle tone in zero gravity. Equally important were Brooks scientists' contributions to MOL life support system development that greatly benefited NASA's manned spaceflight programs. From 1963 to 1969, 90 MOL research experiments were conducted at Brooks. These experiments produced important human factors research that NASA incorporated into its Apollo and Skylab programs. Regrettably, the MOL project was canceled in 1969. It was the victim of a Defense Department cost-cutting budget initiative. Nevertheless, the Air Force project greatly contributed to the success of its 1970s-era successor, NASA's Skylab. Skylab benefited from the work of two Brooks Air Force-based space medicine pioneers. Dr. William Thornton, the first Air Force scientist to become an astronaut, collaborated with cardiologist and future Air Force General John Ord to develop several space physiological devices used on Skylab. The devices that I did at Brooks for mold, of course, were picked up and used very successfully on Skylab by NASA, supported every day, uh, both the operations and various investigations there. Some of these devices were later adapted by NASA for its space shuttle program. Dr. Thornton invented a scale used to measure human weight readings in a weightless environment. The mass measuring device was built at Brooks by School of Aerospace Medicine fabrication shop technicians. It became an important Skylab tool in determining the metabolic balance of astronauts' food intake. Necessity is the mother of invention. At that time, there was simply no way to, if you will, weigh things in weightlessness. And yet at the same time, 
a number of essential programs, the key programs, demanded mass measurement in weightlessness. Neither NASA nor the Air Force had been successful in uh, development. Their contractors had not been able to produce it, so I, uh, to get on with it, we had to have it, and I took a year out here at Brooks and just hammered it out a piece at the time over the year until we got the kind of accuracies that we needed. Dr. Thornton's development of many other space medicine devices and investigative protocols also helped NASA ensure the health and vitality of astronauts working in space. His work advanced space medicine research through inaugural physiological measurements in zero gravity that NASA had not previously investigated. They had not measured ambulatory blood pressure, blood pressure whenever people were free to move around down there. They, uh, even the EKG had not been recorded under such conditions. And the big one was once the uh, weight loss was verified, the time course of it, the big one was what causes the loss. So measurement of the fluid shifts, items such as this, it was just a whole range of measurements that were required. Brooks scientists also played an important role in space food development. During its early years, NASA had no capability for or plans to create a space food development program. The space agency again turned to the Air Force for support. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine scientists had instituted a developmental space food program years before NASA began sending men into orbit. The program, headed by biochemist John Vanderveen, was an outgrowth of Air Force studies to determine the types of food and delivery systems best suited to feeding Air Force pilots at high altitudes. Our contracts with NASA dealt with the evaluation of foods and uh, what the impact would be on the individual and also the environment that was in there. Uh, we then would take each menu that was being put on board the uh, spacecraft for the next mission, whether it was um, mostly by the time I arrived here, it was Apollo missions, but the astronauts would like changes in food systems that would make it more convenient for them to do their job and also make the food more uh, acceptable. It, it, there were some problems associated with the early feeding system. The, the major problem was that there was no texture to the food. NASA had initially fed astronauts with commercially developed bite-sized food cubes, tubes of semi-liquids, and dehydrated food in plastic bags. NASA subsequently discovered that total food consumption during Mercury and Gemini flights was insufficient to provide astronauts with the nutrients they needed. Nutritional deficiencies led to body tissue loss that resulted in a decrease in astronauts' physical performance and mental acuity. The School of Aerospace Medicine at Brooks conducted a series of studies for NASA to measure the nutrient requirements of men living in a simulated space environment. These studies were conducted in low pressure chambers to provide an atmosphere comparable to NASA's planned future space vehicles. From each of the flights, from the Gemini uh, to the Apollo flights, um, we tested that food here with our subjects in the altitude chambers before they ever used it. Prior to and immediately following each study, body composition measurements were calculated for each test subject to determine space food's dietary effects. These effects were measured in the total body volumeter device built at Brooks. And see, we looked at the foods to see whether they really liked it, because if they sent a whole food package back, that meant they didn't like it, or if they had just barely started to eat on it, and then they thought, well, oh, I don't like this. So, um, of course, we weighed them when they went in the chamber, and then we weighed them when they got out of the chamber, and this is the way that we knew whether they um, had had an adequate diet or not. He put them in there before they went in the, the altitude chamber, and then he weighed them afterwards, and then that's how we could tell whether the foods had been nutritionally adequate for that amount of time. The results of these initial Air Force studies showed that lean body weight measurements were very reliable for estimating human caloric requirements. Brooks space food researchers used data from the caloric studies to develop space food dietary protocols. 
These protocols supported NASA's spaceflight criteria for compact space food that needed no refrigeration and was nutritionally viable for weeks while exposed to temperature extremes. The Brooks Space Food Studies also addressed such issues as food acceptance on long space missions and dehydration related to nutrient absorption in a prolonged zero-gravity environment. The whole day's meal was put into one of these foil packages and they were sort of decompressed, you know, the air was all taken out of it so that they could be put on a space flight and they wouldn't take up very much room. And of course there was no water in them so they didn't have any weight and uh, the whole menu was put in that. Well, so then we said, well, maybe they wouldn't like what was put in there. So that's when we began to test the food here. Brooks Air Force Base became NASA's primary test center for space food development. Airmen volunteers, primarily from Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, contributed to space food research as test subjects. They were sequestered in altitude chambers for weeks. One of the longest space food experiments conducted at Brooks was a 72-day test that confined four airmen in a chamber for 56 days. Air Force space food research contributed to the development of tube foods, menus, formulations, and diets for astronauts. Nearly 40 different space foods were developed, including soup, shrimp cocktail, and roast beef. Brooks space food research earned a reputation for helping test and evaluate popular commercially developed products such as the orange drink Tang that astronauts drank during NASA's early years. The sacrifices of airman test subjects and the ingenuity of